All right, so amphibian and reptilian anatomy and physiology. So same as the birds, we're gonna hit on the major points. You're gonna get the more fine-tuned aspects when you go into exotics, okay? So you have reptilia, which includes the crocodiles, alligators, snakes, lizards, turtles, tortoises, and I don't even know what those are. Tuataras? Mm -hmm. Okay. Under amphibians, you have the Sicilians, frogs, toads, salamanders, and newts. Yeah. Oh, those are the ones that we don't have in the U.S. though, right? New Zealand. Okay. Yeah, New Zealand. They're super cute. I want to pet them. They're real <laughs> cute. Hey, you want to them. Oh, that's true. Good point. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the main thing is that they are ectothermic, which means that they're the cold-blooded. Um, they cannot generate their own body heat internally. So their body heat is dependent on their environment, which is very important when they're in captivity because you can cause a lot of problems if the enclosure is too hot or too cold. Um, there are exceptions. The leatherback sea turtles can regulate their body heat and pythons can do muscle contractions when they are sitting on eggs apparently just in case I wasn't scared enough of pythons. So they have the ability to maintain body temperature according to the metabolic need. So they can move within their habitat, they can change their postures, um, and some of them can even adjust their skin color and pattern like the geckos. So the body temperature is manipulated depending on the metabolic needs. So it allows them to survive on small amounts of food. So the goal is to keep them within their optimal temperature range so that they can perform all of their metabolic functions. But if the temperatures get too low, they may go into hibernation. Look how cute he is. <laughs> So reptiles have the epidermis, which has the distinct scales um, and osteoderms. The dermis is a dense connective tissue with blood and lymph vessels and nerves and chromospores. And the subcutaneous space is very, very limited and it is very difficult to give a sub-Q injection to a reptile. I have tried to do it, it's hard. Um, scales vary in size and shape. The snakes have the modified scale over their eyes instead of an eyelid. So it's called a spectacle. And when they are shedding, sometimes that's what gets stuck. And then it looks like they can't see anything, which they probably can, but no, they can't. it's not like they can, they can tell us. So, um, wait, did you say their eyes are made out of scales? Just the eyelid, oh. not the whole eye. Just the yeah, eyelid. So when they shed, they actually shed their eyelid. Yeah. And so it looks really cool. Oh. And so if they don't get that off, you can, uh, for pythons, they tend to have uh, either a spider-like effect on their eye or mm -hmm. um, as they can look like a bluish tint. They look like that glaucoma. Yeah, and you have to take it off. Mm-hmm. Not me, because I'm not touching it. <laughs> somebody will take it off. I have. You like those. I don't like snakes. No, um, yeah, well, I work at a pet store that has snakes, and we have big snakes and small snakes, and my boss soaks them, and when they have uh, stuff on their eyes, and he soaks them, and then he holds his head and puts a Q-tip uh, and rubs it. Mm -hmm. and until it comes off mm -hmm. and so it's nice and easy but the snakes don't really pissed after that mm -hmm. but that's what we do if you bring them to the er mm -hmm. so so it's like saves like a 100 bucks yeah exactly you just <laughs> saved yourself actually for exotics it's even more than 100 i think it's like 115 just Holy to cow. walk in the door for an exotic really for yeah. 
Normally it's about 60 for a rabbit. Same. It's 100 for, well, no, for a rabbit it'd still be 115. For like, like for an hospital? emergency visit. Oh, emergency visit. Okay, mm -hmm. that makes more sense. Um, and that's at Metro, which is cheaper than MedVet. So yeah. I don't even know how much MedVet would charge for that. So the scale and skew nomenclature aids in species identification and medical recording. There's different types of keratin. You have the alpha, which is softer and more flexible. So that's found in the interscalar skin and the beta, which is more rigid and found in the scales. There's the shedding. Um, it's either due to growth or response to skin injury. It is controlled by the thyroid gland. Just in case you guys might wanna know that for, you know, I don't know, tomorrow. And the dead skin is called exuvia. So the cells replicate a new epidermis. Lymph is secreted between the old and the new layers. The skin color starts to dull. Um, the spectacle becomes opaque. The lymph gets reabsorbed and then they mechanically rub the skin off. Uh, but we were saying how it looks like they have glaucoma. That's the spectacle becoming opaque. So they just have to rub it off. Sometimes they don't want to rub their face on stuff. Can't say I blame them. It's kind of reminds me of like if you get a really bad sunburn and people try to peel off like that whole big oh, piece yeah. of skin. Like that's what it kind of reminds me of. Yeah. <clears throat> so amphibians have um, a single or few layers of keratinized cells in their epidermis. No keratinized cells in aquatic amphibians because they have drink patches which are really permeable and that's how they get all of their water. They do not actually drink water. Their outer layer shed regularly. The dermis is chromospores and the cutaneous space is again minimal to non-existent. Don't try to do a sub-Q injection. It's very hard. So the vision, um, the iris is made up of skeletal muscle, so it is under voluntary control just like the birds are. It is not affected by any of the medications that we would normally use to dilate an eye. Sometimes you can get a pupillary light reflex, but not always. So they have thin transparent lower eyelids and Third eyelids are still nictans, true eyelids or spectacles, which the, see I told you, I tried to warn you guys I was tired. Um, the extra ocular muscles are poorly developed, so a lot of times they cannot move their eyes a whole lot. They have to move their whole head. They do have nasolacrimal ducts that help them to swallow. Um, and then lacrimal and hard area and glands. So they have the ossicles, lens, retina, papillaris. They have the tapetum so that they will reflect light. You guys know that that's what reflects light at night? Mm -hmm. Okay. And a perennial eye. The heart, this is kind of cool actually, as much as I don't like snakes. So the location of the heart varies with the species, but they have three chambers instead of four. There's two atria and then a shared ventricle. This to me seems like it gets really confusing what blood is going where, but they always work it out. So, so the ventricle has three reasons three regions, the cavum venosum, the cavum arteriosum, and the cavum pulmonal. So this picture, I think, does a little bit better job of explaining how the blood doesn't get crisscrossed. So it goes from the general circulation, 
down to the sinus vena, venosus, right atrium, to the cavum venosum, cavum pulmonale, up to pulmonary circulation, back to the left atrium, down to the cavum atriosum, and then back to the ven venosum, where it goes back to general circulation. So really the only time it would possibly crisscross is when it goes to that cavum venosum. They're just really good at timing. So heart rate is dependent on the species, the size, the temperature, the activity level, the metabolic function. So what you're gonna do is take 33.4 and multipl multiply it by the weight in kgs. Now, this is where you want to be very, very careful because a lot of times with reptiles, they are weighed in grams. So double check how your weight is recorded before you try to figure out what the heart rate should be. It is very hard to monitor um, cardio in reptiles. The only time I think I have ever tried to do cardiac monitoring is when they were not doing well and like they were passing away and I would check with a Doppler crystal to see if I can even hear a heart rate anymore. When you do a heart rate on reptiles or like a snake or something, do you have to like shut their mouths so that they don't bite you while doing heart rate? I feel like they would lash out. I'm gonna be a hundred percent honest with you. I have never done a heart rate on a snake because I refuse to touch them. <laughs> I am like phobia terrified of snakes. I really am. It too. depends on the snake. So, like, if it's a calmer snake, you. I don't mind messing with But they the tend to bird restrain bird. them anyhow. Nope. When I was in school, we had to do. Um, Oops. We had a. Um, the reptile guy come in, and he had, like, this giant Burmese python. Okay, she's real pretty, but my teacher's like, you just have to touch her. Like, all you have to do is touch her, and then I won't make you mess with her anymore. I got, like, this close to touching her and had a complete breakdown. Like, she felt so bad. She's like, I'm so sorry. I did not realize it was an actual phobia. I really thought you were just afraid of them, and I thought you'd get over it. And I was like, no. <laughs> so, every time this night came into Metro, I hit. So the lymphatic system is going to be unique in the reptiles and amphibians because they don't have large lymph vessels near arteries and veins. They don't have any lymph nodes, but they do have lymph hearts throughout their systems. Do those uh, blood cells look like they have anything in common with anybody else we know? The birds. Yep. They're nucleated. They are nucleated red blood cells, or they are nucleated blo <clears throat> red blood cells. Again, they're going to be bigger than mammals. Their red blood cells last a lot longer than anybody else's. 600 to 800 days. So, I mean, that's like two and a half years, right? Am I doing that math right? Okay. Sometimes you will see immature red blood cells. Mostly it's gonna be in juveniles or when they're doing their shedding. So they again have the heterophils which are round cells with eosinophilic rod-shaped granules in the cytoplasm and a round to oval nuclei. Eosinophils are gonna be similar to heterophils except the granules are round. Basophils are small round cells with deep blue cytoplasmic granules and the granules will often obscure the nucleus. Monocytes are the largest leukocytes in circulation, gray-blue cytoplasm with small vacuoles or fine granules, and azerophilic monocyte variation. Lymphocytes are large round cells with large nucleus. Um, you can find large and small cells together, no granules. Thrombocytes are small oval nucleated cells, cytoplasm is colorless. So, respiratory system, again, very different from mammals. 
They can function with very low oxygen levels. They have a large pulmonary volume, a very efficient anaerobic, which means what? Anaerobic. Um. Without oxygen. Okay. So think about it, aerobic, like when you're doing aerobics, yeah. you breathe hard. So if there's an an in front of it, it means without. So they have an efficient anaerobic metabolism, cardiac shunting capability, so they can survive for long periods without breathing. Respiration is driven by oxygen levels in the blood, contrast to carbon dioxide levels in mammals. So they're not going to breathe just because they have a buildup of the carbon dioxide, they're gonna breathe because they're low on oxygen. The glottis is in the rostral portion of the oral cavity found behind the tongue in all species. It's very mobile in snakes. Like even this picture is just grossing me out. Protrudes from the mouth to allow respiration during ingestion of prey mm -hmm. and is open only during respiration. So most amphibians and reptiles do not actually have vocal cords but they can vocalize by obviously hissing. We've all heard that. Grunting, and then has anybody ever heard a crocodile or an alligator bellow? It's kind of cool. Look it up on YouTube, I'm sure you can find a video. It's kind of cool. Um, frogs and toads have vocal sacs from the tra that arise from the trachea, and they produce those calling sounds that we've all heard as the air moves in and out of the vocal sacs. So you've heard frog calls, right? Okay. Huh. The glottal keel is present in some species of snakes and it increases the volume of the vocalizations so they can be heard from farther away and the prey will run away. So the reptilian lungs have three distinct structures. The unicameral lung, the multicameral lung, and the podicameral lung, which I'm guessing from the picture you can all figure out how that works out. Pulmonary tissues look like honeycombs in uh, amphibians and reptiles. The openings terminate in the fabuli, which are fixed structures that do not expand or contract. They are surrounded by capillaries and they're still the site of the O2 CO2 change exchange. They also do not have true diaphragms. So the respiration is done through the intercostal muscles and parts of the axial musculature. And the axial musculature is what? So the crocodilian respiratory system, they respirate through a hepatic piston, which is a muscular septum caudal to the lungs. The cranial aspect of the liver attaches to the septum. So diaphragmat diaphragmaticus muscle attaches caudal aspect of the liver to the pubis, and lung inflammation is a result of the contraction of the diaphragmatic. Aromaticus. Amphibians, pulmonary ventilation is from pumping of buccal cavity and pharynx, and the gas exchange actually happens across mucous membranes in the buccal cavity, pharynx, and cloaca. Chameleons have air sacs that arise from the ventral aspect of the trachea, so they're involved in their behavioral displays, but there's not actually <coughs> any gas exchange capabilities in them. Snakes mostly have a single right lung. Small size left lung to pr is present in like the bigger, bless you. I don't have it. <laughs> 
boas and pythons, and there is a tracheal lung present in some species. So the ears are on the sides of the head, caudal to the eyes, and snakes have no external ears. The tympanum lies in a depression. It can be covered by folds of skin, and they're not present in salamanders and the Sicilians. <coughs> The columella is a single bone in the middle ear of the reptiles, which connects your tympanum and your quadrate bone. Vibrations are transmitted to the oval window of the cochlea. Vibrations are converted to nerve impulses and the impulses are transmitted to the brain. Does that sound familiar? Okay. The snake columella articulates with the quadrate bone. Semicircular canals control balance and equilibrium in the reptiles. And they have endolymphatic sacs in the middle ears of snakes, frogs, toads, and some lizards that function as a calcium secreting gland. Because hypocalcemia is a problem with reptiles, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So do they get... Um, special treats or how do you stop you, them? Uh, not having enough calcium. So you give calcium supplements. So like a uh, powder on okay. their veggies, their uh, crickets or anything like that. And you're, for most of them, for like reptiles, you're supposed to have the UVB so they can absorb the calcium. Hmm. If that species is supposed to have the UVB. Some of them don't require it. Mm -hmm. So like snakes don't require it and as they snakes don't require the supplements because they eat rats and mice and stuff, so which has the calcium, which breaks it down in the bones. Okay. I know that like for beardies and stuff, you have to do the calcium. Yeah, the calcium powder. Yeah, that's one of the many reasons that I don't own a beardie because my husband doesn't want to have to give it extra powder. So, Three feeding strategies of your reptiles, carnivorous, omnivorous, or herbivores. Um, strict carnivores would be your snakes, crocodiles, and adult amphibians, which I found very interesting. Um, and some diets are very specialized. So we all know about the forked tongue of a snake and lizard. It functions as a particle delivery system to the vomeral nasal organ. Um, mostly the tongues are going to be fairly mobile structures, um, but it varies according to species. Long with a sticky end and highly projectile would be like your frogs and toads. Um, thick, fleshy, and relatively immobile would be like what? Don't your turtles have like those big, heavy tongues that don't move very much? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of them that don't. Fear yeah. dragons do. They don't move a lot. Oh, really? I mean, they come out a little bit, but not really. Okay. I mean, chameleons have the long projectile ones too. Do they? Yeah. Um, and some have muscular flaps um, to help with the prehension of the food. So the functions of the tongue are gonna to be particle delivery system to the vomeral nasal organ and capturing of prey with linguinal flipping. Which is what I picture exactly when you say linguinal, linguinal flipping, like a little cartoon frog. Mm -hmm. So salivary glands are gonna be numerous in the oral cavities. Um, secretions provide lubrication for ingestion of large prey, and the saliva has enzymes that are going to aid in digestion. Venom glands are modified salivary glands found in the upper jaw, below the eyes, or along the lateral aspects of the lower jaw.
This is what creeps me out. Okay, so dentition is given very significantly according to the family. So, turtles and tortoises, no teeth. Other reptiles can be acrodont, pleurodont, or thecodonts. Acrodont are where the teeth are fused to the biting edge of the mandible and the maxilla. Um, and the teeth are not going to grow back if they get broken off. So some species of lizards are going to have these kind of teeth. The pleurodon are teeth that are attached to the periosteum on the medial aspects of both the mandible, mandible and the maxilla. The teeth are replaced periodically and that would be like your snakes and your um, iguanas. Hey! That... <laughs> These are going to come from sockets in the skull bones. They are replaced periodically and they're found only in the crocodilians. Duh. Six rows of teeth, six. Two mandibular, two maxillary, and two on the palatine. How do you say that, do you know? Pterygoid bones? Probably. I'd probably like that. Okay. So these are the pterygoid. We're going to go with that bones. Um, and yeah, that's a lot of teeth. That's a lot of damage that that thing can do to you. I mean, that's why you don't want to get bit. I don't even want to be in the same room with this, much less get close enough for it to bite me. I mean, it's better if you just let it unhinge and come off of yourself so your um, none of the teeth would actually get embedded in your hand because then you have to dig out the teeth in your hand. If you get bit in the hand by a snake, instead of yanking away or anything like that, it's better just to stay still and let the snake do its thing, either get off of you or uh, if it's gonna go forward, uh, which doesn't feel very good, but you run water on it and then it goes, it goes back. Okay, so number one, what if it's venomous? Because then you're dead. <laughs> well, I don't work with venomous ones, so I don't know about that. Okay. Number two, how do you stay calm when there's a snake biting you? My boss does it all the time. He gets bit every day, I swear by a snake he just like madison this snake won't get off of me and so i have to go over and spray it with a spray bottle my cat no, no. <laughs> pretty <laughs> much because some snakes are like i'm not gonna get off of you because sometimes that's what happens when he um uh <coughs> tries to take off shed off off of some snakes he gets nailed and then he's like well, this one won't get off of me. Now I have to call Madison. So <laughs> I run over with a spray ball, spray him off. That doesn't happen. He goes under the cold water and then he gets off and then he's fine. As long as, long as he doesn't yank or anything, now the teeth are going to go into his skin, <coughs> which then he would have to dig out because that would create an infection and everything. Oh, boy. <coughs> you literally might have just killed me. All right, let's take a break so I can go get some water.